Welcome to our English worship this morning. In May 2023, we began a new sermon series on the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments of Yahweh, and the Ten Commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what are the Ten Commandments? The Decalogue begins with a set of triplets about loving God: no other gods, no other images, no other names. Then we have two positive commandments: remember the Sabbath, honor father and mother. And that two commandments are also about loving God. Even the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, is essentially a short form of honor your father and mother who honor the Lord your God. So five commandments about loving God are followed by a set of triplets, another set of triplets. Now this time about loving neighbors: do not murder, do not commit adultery, and do not steal. And finally, we have two rather peculiar commandments in the negative: do not bear false witness, and do not covet. Christian often divide the Ten Commandments into two halves: the first half of loving God, and the second half of loving neighbors. Yet, more accurately, the Decalogue should be seen as one command, only one God, with nine footnotes. I think this is a much more helpful way to understand the Decalogue. All other nine commandments orbit around the first commandment. In other words. All ten commandments are about loving God with all our heart, and all our soul, and all our might. The Decalogue is like a train of ten segments. is led by the train engine, the first commandment of loving God with all our heart, and it is followed by nine other segments, all going in the same direction. The train engine takes us to a narrow. Way through which we will take flight into the sky, living for God and His eternal kingdom. So consider the sixth commandment: "You shall not murder." The story actually takes us back to the first murder in the history of mankind, to the story of Cain and Abel. And the final application, as you may remember, is not "Do not be like Cain who murdered his brother." The final application is. Live like Abel, who loved God with all his heart, and offer his best and his all to God. If this is so with the sixth commandment, we should really expect the same with the seventh commandment. In other words, the seventh commandment would not only call us to love our neighbor, but rather it call us upwards, heavenward, to love our Lord with all our hearts. So what then is the seventh commandment? This is the seventh commandment: You shall not commit adultery. To all of us here living in the modern era, there's perhaps no other commandment more combustive and explosive than this one: You shall not commit adultery. What does it mean? Well, on the most fundamental level, it means stay faithful to. Your marital vow. So, in the most fundamental level, it applies to the married couples. Stay faithful to your marital covenant and stay away from extramarital affairs. But if we can expand it further, it will mean saying no to all unlawful sexual activities and unchaste thoughts and speeches. Now you begin to. Understand why I said there's perhaps no other commandments more combustive and explosive than this one. Consider the world that we live in. We have just lived through the 20th century, the century of sexual revolution, of sexual liberation, and then we look around. We see the prevalence of sex before and outside of marriages. We see the laxity of censorship on television, movies, and all kinds of social media. Then we see the pervasiveness of pornographic materials, the legalization of prostitution, 
and we have also the common and acceptable practice of casual sex, cohabitation, divorce, and remarriage. And even now today, there's a growing popularity of homosexuality, gender choice, transgender lifestyle, and even discussion about gender fluidity. So with all these in the backdrop, how dare we say to this world, to this modern world, you shall not commit adultery. Are you still living in the stone age? Yet, you shall not commit adultery is exactly what God called us to, both yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Now that made me think about Westminster Shorter Catechism written in the year 1647. It has two questions concerning the seven commandments. Question number one, what is required in the seven commandments? Question number two, what is forbidden in the seven commandments? And the answer is given by a group of pastors in 1647 in England are these. The seven commandments requires the preservation of our own and our neighbor's chastity in heart, speech, and behavior. The seven commandment forbids all unchaste thoughts, words, and action. Well, think about this. In heart, speech, behavior, thoughts, words, action, for us and for our neighbors. How comprehensive and thorough is that? But let me tell you that I actually don't like the answers. We must press on to ask, are these two Q and A's all God has in mind when he gave us the seven commandments? Apparently, hundreds of years ago, people think so. These are the things that you should learn from seven commandments. But I don't think so. I think God is telling us a lot more out of the seven commandments. Indeed, I believe God is speaking loudly to us through the seven commandments. And in particular, I want to say that God is speaking to four kinds of people in our midst. First, God is speaking to a group of unbelieving and self-righteous moralists. You know, there are people who don't like the story about Jesus. They will not go to church. They don't believe they need a savior, but yet they will affirm with the church, I believe in the seven commandment. Adultery is indeed the cardinal sin, the problem with our society. So they are the moralists. The seventh commandment is here to expose and crush these people's self-righteousness and our self-righteousness. That's one. Second, I think the seventh commandment is speaking to the liberals among us. There are people who are not believing. They are unbelieving. They are rebellious. Liberal, they said, sexuality is not to be judged. You know, as long as I'm not doing harm to other people, as long as I'm not forcing it on anybody, who is there to judge me? The seventh commandment is here to declare God's holy standards and his righteous judgment upon this liberal. Then I also believe that the seventh commandment will be speaking to a second kind of liberal. These are what people usually call, or I call them, the believing, yes, unrepenting Christians. Oh, there are Christians who read the Bible and who know about the seventh commandment and who know that the seventh commandment is to be timeless, but yet they are unrepenting of their own lifestyle. There's a way that they want to live. So what do they do? They say, well, you know, we are all sinners. And so the grace of God will cover our sins so I can continue to live like this and live like a Christian. The seventh commandment will be here to challenge and demolish our theology of cheap grace. And finally, uh, the seventh commandment will speak to another group of moralists. These are the people who are Christians, believing but struggling with sexual sins, both in the past, in the present, and perhaps in the future as well. They are ashamed. They feel condemned and without hope. And let me say that the seventh commandment is here to offer us gospel forgiveness 
and hope in Christ. I won't be able to talk more about these four kinds of people until two weeks from now when we do the application. But I want, to know, I want you to know that the seventh commandment is here for us, especially for Christians who have committed what a lot of people consider cardinal sin. How many Christian couples walking down the aisle, knowing deep in their heart, full of shame because they are not virgins anymore. But yet, the gospel is here to offer us both forgiveness and hope in Christ. We'll come back to that in two weeks. But now, I want to take you back to the Bible. 3,000 years ago, in Mount Sinai, uh, under Mount uh, Sinai wilderness, Yahweh came down from heaven and gave us the seven commandments. Yahweh shouted, you shall not commit adultery. If we are to use a picture to represent the seven commandments, what would it be like? Now, this is what I envision. This is a picture of the seven commandments or the violation of the seven commandments. So someone may say, ah, Pastor Lam, I got this one. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not have any extramarital affair. Hey, just like the Sixth Commandment. The Sixth Commandment is about Cain and Abel, the first murder. So I know the Seventh Commandment is, must be about Adam and Eve, the first couple. So it's about Adam who forsook the marital covenant with Eve and had an extramarital affair and this time with Satan, the serpent. Now, wait a minute. That does not sound too right. It's only half correct. As it turned out, Eve was the one tempted with an affair, and she, together with Adam, committed adultery. Who then was sinned against? Who was the victim in this adulterous drama? And the answer is, it was Yahweh, their God. That's the picture that God wanted us to see. And if you can use your imagination, try to picture God as the husband, not, not the wife, right? And Adam and Eve as the wife turning into an adulteress. And Satan, the serpent, as the adulterer outside of the marriage. That is the picture you should envision when you think about you shall not commit adultery. That takes us to the main passage for today. Leviticus chapter 18. A rather unfamiliar and rather disturbing passage. Uh, if you uh, pay attention to what Jason just read out, right? You almost wanted him to stop. That's enough, Jason. There's no need to read more. Before we dive into the adultery section, let, let us pay close attention to the prelude. The prelude is actually far more important than the adultery section. And we begin with something like this. And the Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the people of Israel. I'm the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you live. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan. I'm bringing the land I'm bringing you to. You shall not walk in the statue. Three verses give us three points to consider. Point number one, there was one true God. I am the Lord. I'm the Lord your God. I'm the Lord who have taken you out of Egypt. Point number one, there was one true God. Point number two, there are two centers of idols and false God. One is called Egypt. The other one is called Canaan. Now, some, sometimes we got confused about it. it was like, isn't Canaan the one, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land God is bringing us to? It's all true. Isn't Canaan the good land? Yes, it's true. But look at this. It is also, at the same time, a land full of idols and false gods. So point number one, there's only one true God. And there are two centers of idols and false gods. And thirdly, in these two centers of idolatry, there are evil statues and practices of the land. What kind of evil practices? Fornication and adulterous 
affair without shame. Oh, so you begin to see there is a deep connection between idolatry and adultery. You see, one is I, one is A. Idolatry and adultery are interconnected. They are inseparable. So there are two points I want you to get out of these three points. One is that there is this deep connection between idolatry and adultery. Number two, the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery, given at Mount Sinai at the time of Exodus, is a commandment that looked backward and forward, linking the past and the future. What is the past? The past is Egypt. So the seventh commandment actually takes us back to Egypt, to the idolatry as well as adultery of Egypt, and then take us forward as a warning that you are entering into another land of idolatry and adultery in Canaan. Egypt and Canaan are very much alike. And here we are situated in the middle of the wilderness. God said, look back and see what I will do to them. And look forward to see the place that I'm taking you there. Be forewarned. Do not commit adultery. I was speaking of adultery in Exodus. You got to think about the story of the golden calf. You remember there was this interesting verse that when I studied the golden calf with you, I put an emphasis on. Exodus chapter 32, verse 6. And they rose up early the next day. The next day, the day before, they make the golden calf, right? And so they went to sleep. It was a long day. And then they couldn't wait to get up the next day. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt sacrifice offerings. And they offered peace offering. And then the people sat down to eat and drink. And then the people rose up to play. Now here we see a mixture, a clear mixture of idolatry and adulterous practices. You see, they rose up to play, if you remember from my old sermons mean it has a sexual connotation. So they created this idol in the fashion of Egyptian gods. And when you worship Egyptian god, worship idol, how do you worship? Well, you worship with food and drink. You worship with offering. But one more thing, you worship with idolatrous affair. You worship with sex, sex with prostitutes, sex with each other, sex orgies. So you can imagine how excited the Israelites were. They were taken out of Egypt. And when they're out of Egypt, they could not do the orgies anymore. But now, in the absence of Moses, Moses up high up in the mountain, there's this air of lawlessness. So we can create this golden calf. We'll worship golden calf like we did in Egypt. And what do we do? We mix idolatry with adultery. Today, people seeking sexual ventures may find their way to the so-called red light district. As it turned out in the ancient world, in the world of ancient East, the red light district was situated right near or inside the temple of the idol and false god. Hi, honey. I have to go to worship God today. You know, it's a time of the year. What are you doing? Why you want so eager to go to the temple of the idol and false god? As it turns out, that is the red light district. And this is why you begin to understand why the worship of false god is so attractive to simple human beings. Because they have created a religion in which it's legitimate to have all sorts of fornication as well as idolatrous affair. But these evil practices must stop now for Israelites because they have been delivered out of the house of idols. They have been delivered out of the house of adultery. And they must follow the law of Yahweh. Leviticus chapter 18, verse, 14, uh, verse 4. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I'm the Lord your God. What kind of rules and statutes? Well, you know, if you keep reading, 
to verse 6, you begin to see the sexual rules and statutes do not commit adultery become the forefront. It is in this context, the statutes and the rules are all about sexual purity. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. I'm the Lord who have taken you out of Egypt. You cannot live like you were in Egypt anymore because you belong to us. Now that takes us to some of those very, very disturbing verses when we violate the laws and the rules and the statute of our God. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 6. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness and the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. Okay, three verses, enough. I'm not going to read more. The remaining verses, as you may remember, follow the same formula. But the contents got darker and darker. In fact, I stopped at verse 17 and there's more to go. You know, uh, one worship leader even asked me, do you want to read more? Oh, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't. I want to stop at 17 because there are worse things that happen in verse 18, 19 and 20. So I want you to notice two things. The first, God did not make up these scenes. You know, as it turned out, thousands of years ago in an ancient world, people are committing things that are way worse than what we are experiencing today, right? Sometimes we think that we are all that advanced, that we are the true liberal. We're truly free. Look at 3,000 years ago in the ancient Near East, you know. Look at what were they doing. These are not make of sins. These are the practices, the statue, what is permitted, what is common to the people who worship idol in that world. So we are no more advanced than they are. That's one. But the more importantly, I want you to notice one thing. How do you define an adulterous affair? How do you describe an adulterous affair? And here is one graphical expression. An adulterous affair is described as the uncovering of nakedness. You see that? Right? You shall not uncover nakedness. You shall not uncover so-and-so's nakedness. So-and-so nakedness. Why is this expression important? Because it reminds us of another story in the Bible. It takes us back to the Garden of Eden. What happened? What did you see in the Garden of Eden? What was being described in the Garden of Eden? It is an uncovering of nakedness. I want to take you back to Genesis. Let's first look at the rebellion of Adam and Eve, which you should all be very familiar with. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God said, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then, in chapter 3, verse 8, so verse 6, So when the women saw that the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, desire to make one wise, she took some of the food and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he hated. it. Now, so this is the rebellion. We know that. We have talked about it all the time. How does the Bible describe the change as a result of this rebellion? And the way the Bible describes the change as a result of the rebellion is the uncovering of nakedness. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, the man and the woman were both naked and were not ashamed. Chapter 3, verse 7, then the eyes of both were open and they knew they were naked and they sew fig sleeves together and make themselves loincloth. Now, so on the surface, it looks like, well, their eyes got open. That's why they saw. Actually, it's not that simple. Biblical scholars tell us that the nakedness in chapter 2 and the nakedness in chapter 3 are actually two different Hebrew words. There is an implication that something has changed between 2 and 3. It's not so much that their eyes were open. It is that the nakedness A in chapter 2 has become nakedness B in 
chapter 3, something has changed dramatically. And again, we are not simply talking about moving from nakedness A to nakedness B. We are actually talking about moving from nakedness G to nakedness and G. And G, of course, stands for good. Everything God made was good. If you think about in Genesis chapter 1, after the first day, good. Second day, good, good, good. When God had finished the creation, it was very good. And now it is no good. The good, the nakedness in chapter 2 is good. The nakedness in chapter 3 is no more good. Not because God is not good, but because men have fallen into a comprehensive and thorough rebellion. So we ask this question, what sin did Adam and Eve commit? It is a sin of rebellion. It is a sin leading to death. But it is also a sin of adultery. Why? Because it's expressed as uncovering of nakedness. So when you read the biblical literature, when you realize that the uncovering of nakedness is a symbol of sexual sin or adultery, then you begin to see here that the sin that they have committed is a sin of adultery. Now, not because they actually have intercourse with Satan. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't think so. But because there existed a marital bond and covenant between Yahweh and humanity before the fall. You see that God and man were in a marital bond and covenant. I will talk more about this in application sermon. But the poor man is now being seen as an adulterous affair, a spiritual adultery, but an actual adultery nevertheless. Now that takes us back to Exodus. As you may remember, in Exodus, through God's gracious and marvelous deliverance, Yahweh established a three-in-one relationship with the Israelite. He is a merciful master. They are the liberator servant. He is the loving father. They are his beloved son. And finally, the climax of all, he is a self-giving husband. And Israel is supposed to be his sanctified wife. But sadly, just as in Genesis, when Adam and Eve gave in to Satan's temptation and committed an, an act of spiritual adultery, right? Here in Exodus, what happened? The Israelites fell to the temptation and worshipped the golden calf in an act of spiritual as well as physical adultery. You see that history is repeating itself. After God had delivered them, they fell back to the golden calf, and this time it is a spiritual adultery, but it's also a physical adultery because they rose up to play, breaking the covenant with Yahweh. And tragically, this act of adultery or idolatry will continue into the land of Canaan. You see, they are moving from Exodus into the land of Canaan, eventually leading up to what I call the ultimate affairs. If someone asks you, what is the ultimate act of adultery in the Old Testament? What would you say? Someone asks you, what is the ultimate act of adultery in the Old Testament? What would you say? Multiple choice. Is it A, David and Bathsheba, or B, something else? What would you say? And the answer is something else. What is that something else? It is not David and Bathsheba. It is a horrifying and sexually explicit story, codenamed O and O. And this story, few of you remember, is from Ezekiel chapter 30, uh, chapter 23, with David and Solomon's divided kingdom as a backdrop. Let me take you to this horrifying and sexually explicit story from Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they played a whore in Egypt. 
they played the whore in their youth. There, their breasts were pressed and their virgin bosom handled. What the name of these two women? Ohola was the name of the elder, and Ho-Ho-Labar is the name of her younger sister. So you begin to see it's a spiritual allegory, but yet the words and the description are incredi incredibly vivid and explicit, and I mean sexually explicit. Here we see two sisters. Ohola means her tent. Ohola-Labar means probably my tense is in her. You know, biblical scholars tell us that the symbolism or even the translation have been lost. We are not sure exactly what these two names mean and what is the meaning of the symbolism. But as you can imagine, both names suggest some kind of adulterous affair. In their tense, they invited their lovers and commit adultery with them. Keep reading. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 4. They became mine, these two sisters. Mine is Yahweh. They bore sons and daughters. As for their name, Ohola is Samaria. Now it's becoming clearer. Oholabar is Jerusalem. Ohola played a whore while she was mine, lusted after her lover, the Assyrians. Therefore, I deliver her into the hands of her lovers, into the hands of the Assyrian, after whom she lusted. So we know their name, Ohola, Oholabar, and now we know their identity. They are Samaria and Jerusalem. Now, if you are familiar with the Old Testament, of course, you know Samaria is the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. And Jerusalem is the capital city of the southern kingdom of Judah. But why was the kingdom divided in the first place? Do you remember? The kingdom was divided because of adultery and idolatry. The kingdom was divided because there was this king, this great king called King Solomon. As a result of Solomon's legalized adulteries, idols and false gods filled the land, leading to God's wrath. And punishment. Now, all of us probably, you know, all of you who grew up in church, you know, probably have gone to children's Sunday school learning about how great the young Solomon was. You know, he was given wealth and he was given a promise and he asked God for wisdom instead to rule the country. And you are all giddy about it and you are happy about it and the teacher tells you, be like Solomon. No, no, no. When you read the story, you better read the whole book, right? The story came from 1 Kings. By the time you get to 1 Kings chapter 11, listen to these haunting words and verdict about Solomon. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Just the daughter of Pharaoh should give you pause. But now beyond the daughter of Pharaoh, Egyptian, Solomon loved many women, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, Hittite woman, from the nation concerning which the Lord has said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn you away your heart after their God. Now you begin to see, this is a violation of the Seventh Commandment. Sometimes we think strictly about sex when we come to the Seventh Commandment. But the Seventh Commandment actually regulates the kind of people you are supposed to marry. You know, that's why... You know, later on when we move from the old to the new, when you marry a non-Christian, it's actually a big deal. It's a violation, complete violation of the seventh commandment because here Solomon were marrying them. He was not just having sex with them. He was marrying them. But that displeased the Lord because they are not God's people. Let me keep reading. Solomon had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wife turned his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wife turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Now you have a comparison between Solomon and David. And Solomon way past David. Now again, in two weeks, we'll come back to discuss about the comparison. Why David? did not commit the ultimate, but Solomon seems to have committed the ultimate adultery. 
why David is still savable and why Solomon, at least in this story, is not quite so. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonian, and after Malcolm, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chamosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did all his foreign wives who make offering and sacrifice to their God. And as a result, as a result of his adulteries, as a result of his idolatry, adultery, idolatry, they're interconnected. You cannot be separated. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel. So God would surely tear the kingdom from Solomon. Now, sadly, after the kingdom were divided, guess what? Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, will continue this downward spiral created first with Solomon. That downward spiral is of rampant and continuous idolatry. And so we continue, verse 11, Ezekiel, chapter 23. Her sister, Oho Lebar, that's the younger sister, that's Judah, that's Jerusalem, saw this, and she became more corrupt than her sister in her lust and in her whoring, which was worse than that of her sister. Saw this, saw what? Saw the fact that the northern kingdom of Israel was idolatrous and adulterous, and eventually God punished the northern kingdom by sending the Assyrian down, wipe out the northern kingdom. And the younger sister, Judah, saw this. I witnessed this. This happened in 722 BC. They continue to become more corrupt in the worship of idol. Verse 12, she lusted after the Assyrians, all of them desirable young men. A very graphic story, right? It's a parable. It's, it's an allegory. But it's very graphic. But she carried her whoring further. She saw men portrayed on the wall. Now she have a new lover, the likeness of Babylonians, whose native land was Chaldea. Verse 19, yeah, she increased her whoring remembering the days of her youth in the land of Egypt uh, and lusted after her lovers there, whose members were of those of donkeys and whose issue was that of horses. You see, the, the, the translator, very good, to hide the sexually explicit language. And if you are reading this text, you wonder what after, she lost after her lover there, whose member were like that of donkey. What members are we talking about? Genitals. And then whose issue was that of horses. What issue are we talking about? Emissions. So you see all these words like you would not expect from the Bible. But it's all there to tell you how God is disgusted with the idolatry of the land. So verse 20 Three, O O Ho Labar, behold, I will stir up against you your lover. I will bring them against you from every side, the Babylonian and all the Chaldeans and all the Assyrians. So what happened? God is going to punish the southern kingdom. God sent the Babylonian there, 586 BC, the fall of Jerusalem. Jerusalem wiped out, the temple wiped out, and the people of God were taken into exile. Remember? Far away Babylon in exile. How would God punish idolatry? Exile. Remember this. One more. One more verses. One, one more slide about the ultimate affairs. Verse 28, Ezekiel 23. For thus said the Lord, Behold, I will deliver you into the hands of those you hate. Exile. Into the hand of those whom you turn in disgust. And they shall deal with you in hatred and take you away all the fruits of your labor, wipe you out, take you into exile, and leave you naked and bare. And the nakedness of your whoring shall be uncovered. Now I want you to notice what are the outcome and punishment God will cast down on the ultimate affair. When God's people 
went on adult, adult, adulterous affair. How will God punish them? God will do two things. God will take them into exile. And then God will uncover their nakedness. The nakedness of your whoring shall be uncovered. And then you will be taken into exile. Why is that important? Because that almost takes us back to the book of Genesis. The first adultery, the first adulterous affair. We say for all the crime, there will be a punishment. There will be a punishment that is fitting for the crime. And so we ask, when the people of God commit adultery, violated the seventh commandment, what will be the punishment for them? And the fall and punishment in Genesis and 3 actually parallel the fall and punishment of the idolatrous Judah. The two of them parallel. What punishment? There are two punishments. Number one, the offender's nakedness will be uncovered. Number two, the transgressor will be taken into exile. That was the story of Adam and Eve, you see. After they fall, after they fell, what happened? They, their nakedness is uncovered, and then they are exiled out of the Garden of Eden. And there was the story of Judah, what happened? They will be stripped naked, and then they will be taken exiled into a land far away, away from Jerusalem. And that is supposed to be our punishment as well. That's supposed to be our story as well. But yes, strikingly, do you notice that? It is also the story of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nakedness and exile. Where do you find nakedness and exile? You find nakedness and exile in the cross of Jesus, you see. When Jesus was crucified to the cross, he was stripped naked, outer clothes, gone. His inner clothes, people cast lot on to see who will get them. Because we have to do skit at church. We always have the Jesus figure wearing something. But the historian tells us that he could be totally naked and ashamed. And he was exiled. He could not be crucified within the city of Jerusalem. He has to be crucified outside the city gate, exiled from the holy city. He was supposed to be king in Jerusalem, but he was crucified outside, and he was crucified away from the presence of his Father in heaven. Isn't that amazing? I asked in my WhatsApp message this past Friday, I asked this question, what then is contained in the Seven Commandments? And I answer, surprise, surprise, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll have to wait till next week to continue our story. But before we go, let me once again summarize my sermon today for you with five points. We begin with the shorter catechism, the high calling to be holy and pure in thought, words, and deed. That was what the English pastor, 1647, called us to. That's what the Seventh Commandment is all about. I don't like it. I don't think the Seventh Commandment is just about that. It's a lot more about that. The Seventh Commandment takes us back to the life, the corrupt practice in Egypt and Canaan, immorality. It takes us back to Exodus, the golden calf, idolatry and adultery. It takes us back to Ezekiel, Israel, Judah, sexual immorality, idolatry. And then it takes us back to Genesis, those who have committed idolatry, those who have committed adulterous affairs, that you and me will be punished with nakedness, shame, and taken into exile. How do you go from five back to one? How do you go from five back to one? 
we start with one, we think that we're all that we can do, that we can keep the commandment. And then we roll down together with the biblical story, down to five. How can we get back to one? The answer is the cross of Jesus. He's going to take us back to one. And we'll come back next week to continue that story. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are a great God. You are the God of the covenants. You are the God of the commandments. Oh, the Decalogue, the wonderful ten words of God, the wonderful ten commandments of our Lord. What do you want to say to us? Are you simply here to tell us we should do better? Or you are telling us something far greater, far more glorious. What is embedded in each and every of the commandments is the story of Jesus. He will fulfill all of them. He will suck up all the punishment. He will take up all that punishment that's supposed to be ours so that we can be made pure again, so that we may be returned from exile, so that we may put on Christ as the close of righteousness. And here we stand, righteous, justified, because of him. We pray that we will cherish this gospel story and that we will long to become your faithful wife as the church in the New Testament set their hearts to become to wait for Jesus to return for the wedding of the Lamb here we are humble before your grace plead with you for grace and mercy Gospel forgiveness, gospel strength for all our sins and transgression, for all the temptations and trials ahead of us. May Jesus triumph in our life. We pray all that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.